All right, I, I, I have some really bad news. Uh, this is going to be our last class where we're going to talk about SQL. I know. You guys are doing a great job hiding your disappointment. All right. Uh, I certainly will entertain SQL questions, uh, but it probably will be the last class. Maybe a little bit of it will trickle on to, to Tuesday, but um, we'll see. The stuff I'm going to talk about today is certainly important. I don't want you to lose sight, though, that the stuff that we've covered up to this point is sort of the workhorse of SQL. All right, the select statement with all these other, uh, all the different clauses, is what you're going to be using in most occasions. Some of the other things I'm going to talk about uh, today, and that we talked about last time, uh, even, are definitely sort of what the, you know the edge cases. You know, um, I'm mentioning them. Largely, not because I expect you to be able to do these per se, or that there'd even be a need for you to do them on any assignments or anything for this class, but just so that if you run into it in the future, uh, you may run into a situation where it's required. Um, what I'd like to do is review, first of all, the parts of a SQL select statement. All right. Um, one thing I notice when I'm grading some of the work is, um, people using one part to try to do something else. You know, each part of the SQL statement has a distinct role. And it needs to be put in a distinct sequence. So keep in mind the roles of these things and we'll, uh, you should be fine. First off, the select. We know it starts with the word select. If I am grading something and I don't see the word select, I, I don't even need to read, the, to read the rest of it, right? It's probably not going to be very good. All right? So all the queries start with select. Following select, there can be basically three things. All right? One of them is a list of columns from the database, all right? Or the asterisk for a wild card representing all the columns. We could have an aggregate function. If we want totals or averages or minimums or maximums, if we don't want to see every individual row from the database, but we want to see just something taken in aggregate, something, something, some value for the group of items, we could have aggregate functions. The other thing we could have is we could have a computed column. Well, what is a computed column? A computed column is where you can derive a value from two other columns. For example, if we wanted to show, if we wanted a column to return the full name, let's say, of a faculty person from a faculty table, we could say select F, F name plus a space, in quotes, plus FL name from faculty. And that would return the full name, the first name plus the last name in one column. Likewise, let's say we had a table where there was the length of a, uh, a plot of land and the width of it. We could say select width times length. And it will actually do the math. Or, you know, if we had amount of purchase, tax, we could say select amount of purchase plus tax and get uh, a total. So these are the things that we can list in a select statement. A list of columns, an aggregate function, or some computed columns. We then have the from clause. 
And the from clause contains a list of tables. And know that we're going to put the table in the from clause regardless of where it appears in this select statement. So we don't have to necessarily be um, displaying the column or selecting the column um, from a table. We still have to list the table, even if we only use it in the where clause. Remember last time we talked about how you could have a chain of four or five tables together. And to get to the first table to the last table, you have to link all the tables in order. Well, even if you're not displaying anything from those middle tables, you still have to include it in the from. So list of tables used anywhere in the select statement. We have a where clause. And with the where clause, the where clause does really two things. Number one, it can be used to filter data. That is, we don't want to see everything. We just want to, um, you know, we just want things that meet a certain criteria. You know, we just, we don't want to see every employee. We just want to see employees in the state of Michigan. We don't want to see every student. We just want to see every student with a GPA of 3.5 and greater, and so on. All right, so one thing we can do with a where clause is we can filter data. The other thing we can do is we can join tables together. All right. That is, we can connect them via their keys. All right. Now, if we're using aggregate functions, we can also use a group by clause to say how we want the totals broken down. Or, we can, and in addition to that, we can optionally use the having clause if we want to make a selection based on one of the aggregate functions. For example, we may want to see all of the um, funds where more than a total of $10,000 has been donated to them. All right? Now, if we're not using a group by clause, we can use an order by. And in this case, this tells you the sequence that this is going to be in. You're not going to use the order by and the group by in the same SQL statement. The order by orders individual rows. The group by essentially groups and sequences uh, groups of data. So this is the, each of the clauses that we've looked at so far and the purpose of them. And if you can keep that straight, that's half the battle. I said a good procedure sort of to follow is when you look at it, first decide is it going to be um, a table where we want to see individual rows or is it a table where we want to see, or, or I'm sorry, a query where we only want to see totals? If we only want to see totals, um, and by totals I mean totals, counts, averages, sums, then we want to use a group by clause and aggregate functions. Let me back up for a second. We, we typically would use a group by clause. I guess we don't always use it if we only wanted one line of totals. But if we wanted the totals broken down by something, then we'd use a group by clause as well. So you decide, well, does it need this or does it need, you know, do we want to see individual rows or do we want to see just totals? With totals, you use the aggregate function and maybe a group by. Um, then decide what columns you want to see what tables you're going to be using, how you're going to filter the data, how you're going to join the data, and then if you're using totals, how you're going to group the data, um, how you want the totals broken down by, and if you're not using uh, aggregate functions, then what sequence you want to see them in. So that's kind of it in a nutshell, the select statement. Let's talk about some, a couple of, um, sort of oddball cases, all right? One of them is the union statement, all right? The union statement allows you to treat 
two tables, almost like they're one table as far as the query is concerned. And here's, a, here's a, probably the best example I can think of. All right. Let's say let's say I have a customer table that has a customer ID, customer name, address, city, state, and zip. And I also have a manufacturer a supplier table that has a manufacturer ID, a manufacturer name, address, city, state, and zip. And there might be some other columns as well. But let's say that they have these, common, the, these, these columns sort of in common. All right. Let's say we wanted to produce a mailing to everyone that we did business with. All right. Maybe even employees who have an employee ID, a first name, a last name, address, city, state, and zip. Let's say we wanted a list of all the people that we did business with. And by people, I mean entities, whether they be companies or employees. We wanted to produce a mailing list to mail out something. I don't know, our holiday greetings or a newsletter or whatever. All right? We could select from this table, have a run to give out to the customers. We could select from this table, have a run to give out to the manufacturers, and then uh, um, select from this table, but using the union, we could get a list of everyone in just one query. All right? A query that contains a union. Essentially, the union works like this. I could say, select C name, address, city, state, zip from customer. Union select M name address city state zip from manufacturer union select first name plus space plus last name, address, city, state, zip, from employee. And what that would give us is that would give us one list of everyone that we did business with. In other words, would have our customers listed, then would have our manufacturers, then would have our employees. So let's say we had five hundred customers, twenty manufacturers, and a hundred employees. This query would return six hundred twenty rows. It would give me a list of my customers, followed by a list of my manufacturers, followed by a list of my employees. So it would essentially treat it, as far as a query goes, like it's just one giant table that has everyone in it. All right. This is one of those things, I don't know, it's hard to describe, you know. I'm trying to think of a food comparison, because I always think about food. All right. But it's one of those things that you don't use all the time, but when you do, it really hits the spot, right? I'm trying to, trying to think of something to, to, to eat that, that I don't eat, necessarily eat all the time. But when I do, boy, it really hits the spot. So you won't use the union often, but if you ever need to 
link a bunch of tables together in one giant list, then the union works perfectly for it. Now this is different than the join, right? Remember a join, we're, we're linking rows of the tables or, uh, together. We're matching up the customer that belongs to this uh, employee, let's say. We're joining them, we're, we're joining the tables together. Here we're not joining the tables. We're simply adding the lists together. We're adding all the rows together as opposed to sort of adding the columns together. All right? So that's the union. I don't believe any of the ones, examples that we had for homework requires a union, uh, nor I would doubt if I would put it on a test, but it's one of those that I want to at least mention, so just in case you run across a situation for it, um, you'll have an idea what to do. Now the next, the next one is diabolical, all right? It's one of them that, you know, may cause you to stay up nights because it's complicated and it's involved, all right? And, and it can be confusing. It can be confusing unless you break it down and look at it one piece at a time. But what I'm talking about is, is it's, it's called a subquery. A subquery is where you can actually have part of a SQL statement Instead of having a value, it could contain another SQL statement. So essentially you sort of have two SQL statements rolled into one. Let me give you an example. All right. Let's say I have a table. With employees. And there's the employee ID, last name, first name, blah, 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 and a salary column. All right. What would this SQL statement do? What would that SQL statement do? It would give you the highest salary. So what would the output look like? Just a number, right? So if the highest salary was 125000 that's what the output would be. Do we know who gets that salary from this query? No. How could we get to see the name of the person that has the highest salary. Well, if we didn't know about subqueries, we could do it this way. All right. You could first run this query and get the maximum salary, 125,000, right? Then I could go in and say, select first name last name from employee where salary equals 125,000. And then that would give us the names of all the employees that had that value of salary. So that would give us the answer. That would give us the answer today, right? But what happens if that query it, 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 what happens as, as time goes on? Maybe someone gets a raise and maybe now 130000 is the highest salary for the company. All right? Um, or whatever. The person with 125000 quit, now $110,000 is the highest salary. So in order to get the, the, the name of the person who has the highest salary with this approach, we'd always have to run both queries. Well, that sounds like a lot of work, right? Um, it would be nice if I could just put this in run, one query where I could run it and it could work. Well, if we think about this, where did we get this 125,000 from? We got it from this query, query. This is where I wish we were back in the old days with transparencies. I'll try to emulate that here. There we go. 
That 125,000 we got from this query. All right? So wouldn't be, it be nice if we could just include that query as part of the WHERE clause? Turns out we can, and that's exactly what a subquery is. So, to do what I just described, to get the employee that has the highest salary in one query, we could say this. Select F name, L name, from employee, where salary equals, and then instead of having a number, we would have a query. Select max salary from employee. All right. So the way that this would work is sort of like most things of a mathematical nature work. The inner one would done, be done first. The database would get this query, get the result from it, and then apply the other query and, and use that as a value. Again, you won't do this all the time, but it's really nice to know about this and be aware of this if, if you're trying to write at least certain queries, the subquery. Um, Another reason I'm going over these things, again, is just to, to give you sort of an appreciation of how with SQL there's not a lot of things. You know, we probably have talked about 10, you know, probably less than 10 even, different uh, clauses in SQL statements. And yet the way that those get pieced together, you can, you know, virtually an infinite variety of ways that you can piece things together to get almost any kind of query that you want. Yes? Yeah, you probably can, and, and this is this is why you know this you know, is probably the cause for sleepless nights for 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 people, and then it would essentially from the inside out get evaluated. Uh, news, I know you can. Um, I'm trying to think if I've ever written a subquery inside a subquery inside a subquery. I I don't recall ever doing that. I definitely have written queries like this, though. I've definitely written queries that include. Um, a subquery. All right. Um, one other reason for a subquery, real quick. Let's say I have. going back from last time, an alumni table with an alumni ID with a first name and last name. And I had a donation table that had a donation ID a bunch of other things in an amount field. If I did this, select first name, last name, some amount from donation alumni where donation alumni ID equals alumni alumni ID. Group by first name, last name. If someone didn't make any donations, they wouldn't show up on this list, right? Because it would try to join together and sum up all the donations for a person. There are no donations for the person. So they would not, using that syntax, a person that made no donations would not show up on the list. However, 
If I wrote that as a subquery, one way to get around this, there's probably others, but one way to get around this would be to write a subquery and say select f name l name whoops select some amount from donation where donation alumni ID equals alumni alumni ID from alumni. So in this case, we're, we're including a subquery as like one of the computed columns that gets returned. All right, so we're selecting the first name, last name, and we have a select in there that's going to do a query to give me the value of the total. The difference between this and the other query we showed is that this would show every alumni and would show us the amount of the donation. And if they did not show any donations, if they didn't make any donations, it would show a zero form. The other query wouldn't show someone that didn't uh, make a donation. I don't put these up here because I necessarily expect you to be able to just sort of bust these out off the top of your head. But just sort of to give an awareness and appreciation of the fact that you can actually have SQL statements. You can actually replace pieces of SQL statements with other queries. Now, of course, for this to work, this is going to have to return one value. All right. Whenever you use a subquery, whether it be here or here, the subquery has to only return one value. If it returns more than one value, the subquery isn't going to work. In most cases, <laughs> again, there's a catch. One thing that subqueries uh, are, are used for as well is doing an in. Uh, in other words, we said, for example, select um, something where state in and give a list of states. We could actually give a query to produce those list of states. That's one case of where a subquery could return more than one value. But enough about this. You can tell that this stuff excites me, and I'm able to go on all night if we uh, continue going with this. I really, really loved writing SQL statements when that was part of my job. It, um, that was like, you know, I, I, I took pride on there never being, a, you know, no one could describe a situation that we couldn't write a SQL statement for. All right. Now, why is that important? It's important for us to be aware of all that flexibility because, again, that's one of the selling points of relational databases. All right. That's why data, relational databases are so important and are so good. Flat formats don't lend themselves to being very adaptable and being able to be queried and, and, and output produced in a variety of formats. This extremely powerful structure, uh, uh, language of SQL, which has just a few elements that can be combined in so many different ways, along with our very flexible database design, allows for, you know, the, the, the sky's the limit, as they say, in, as far as flexibility in querying the database and getting the information from the database that you need. So, yeah, um, even if you're not going to write subqueries for this particular class, having an appreciation of the power and the flexibility of SQL, I think is critical in understanding really the flexibility in querying that you have, which again, the more flexible the querying is, the, the better you can process your data and produce information from it. Um, let's see. I do want to go over, I mentioned, and we'll just, uh, we'll just look at it very briefly. I did mention um, that there's a second way to join tables together, all right, other than using the WHERE clause. I teach the WHERE clause because that's probably the most straightforward way to do it. Um, I, I think it's a good way to start. Uh, if you go further in, in SQL, you would want to uh, spend some time investigating the join clause, which is an additional clause in SQL. It's actually part of the from clause. Let's go into access and write a query using the QBE and looking at 
the sequel that it generates. So if I was going to link faculty and student together in a query, and I was going to say select faculty or student Oops. Student first name, student last name, and faculty last name. If we go and do a view SQL, we'll notice a slightly different syntax. Instead of a where clause, it has interjoined student on faculty dot FID equals student dot FID. It's a different way of joining it. What's the advantage of this? Well, there's a little bit of flexibility. Um, some would argue that this is more optimized for doing joining, so it, it would be able to work quicker. But in addition to inner joins, we can do outer joins. All right. What is an inner join versus an outer join? All the joins we've been doing with where clauses have been inner joins. What does that mean? That means that for a row to appear, there has to be something in both tables. So this query right here, or the version of it that we would write using the where clause, These are both examples of inner joins. And what I mean is, is that there would have to be, uh, a student and faculty would have to match up to show here. In other words, a student without a faculty advisor would not appear in this query. All right? Would not appear. Because that join would fail. It would try to match up the student with the faculty member that advises them. If the student doesn't have a faculty member that advises them, there's no match. Therefore, the join would fail and that person would be excluded. Now, the opposite of an inner join is an outer join. And if we click on this, we get this join properties box and we can select what option we want. And the first option says only in include rows where the join fields from both tables are equal. That implies only select those rows where there's a matchup in each table. So this will exclude any students that don't have a faculty ID. I can, however, pick another option. It says include all records from students and those records from faculty where the join fields are equal. So it will show all the students. And if they happen to have a faculty advisor, it will join to it. So we'll go and run this. If we look at the syntax of this, it says right join. Student on faculty ID equals student ID. If we switch it around, it would say left join. In other words, we wanted to see all faculty and the students that matched them. All right. Again, for the purposes of this class, I think it's enough to know this syntax of matching them together. But there is, again, this, this inner and outer joins, which is a somewhat, slightly more powerful option, but it's a little more confusing. So I don't, I don't like to teach it uh, uh, in this class. All right. In addition to querying the database, we can also manipulate the database via SQL. All right. 
That is, we can actually insert rows in new tables, we can update rows in tables, and we can delete rows from tables. If you think about it, you know, think of any web application that you run. All right, eBay, for example. If you go in and, and there's an item that you're bidding on, if you make a bid that's higher than the current bid, what it will do is it will update their database and say, okay, Bob doesn't have the highest bid now, Joe has the highest bid. All right? So it's actually inserting a row into the database every time someone makes a bid that's higher than that. All right? So just as we talked about earlier on where programs have select statements for queries embedded in the middle of them and you have to know the SQL so that you can embed your query into your program, just as, as that's the case, the same thing is true for insert, updating, and delete. All right? For example, you know, when you um, go in and post something to the class's discussion board, for example, you're actually uh, inserting a row into the database. All right, there's a database for the discussion forum, and you go in and say, I wanna, I wanna, ins you know, I wanna add a, a new topic, and you type in the subject, and you type in your post, and click save. That actually inserts a row into that table. All right, likewise, you could, if you deleted it, you could delete, uh, a delete command would uh, happen. Likewise with an edit. What we're gonna do is we're gonna look at those statements, insert, update, and delete, and we're not going to spend as much time as, as the select, all right? Largely because they're a little simpler. Actually, the query is the one that is, uh, of all the SQL statements, is the most involved, has the most clauses and all that. Comparatively speaking, the other statements are um, much more straightforward. All right. First, what we're going to look at is the delete statement. The delete statement is probably the easiest of all, right? But it's probably also the most dangerous, right? Because you're getting rid of something, which, which probably isn't good unless you're doing it right. A delete statement will look like this. Delete from the name of the table and probably a where clause that will say what we want to delete. Couple thing about these statements, the delete, insert, and update. They only work on one table, all right? So uh, unless there's cascading deletes involved, then the foreign key takes care of it. But I'm not gonna write a delete statement to delete from two tables. You don't join tables together in a delete statement like you join tables together in a query. Nor do you in an update, nor do you in an insert. So you're only deleting from one table. Now, just like with the select, unless we specify a where clause, it means everything, right? If I say select last name from employee and I don't put a where clause in, which last names do I get? Everyone's, all right? If I don't put a where clause on a delete, what's it try, gonna try to delete? It's gonna try to delete every row from that table. So often, there's going to be a where clause on it, all right? So for example, if I wanted to delete a person at a faculty ID of one, two, three, four, I would say delete from faculty where FID equals one, two, three, four. If it's a numeric field, you don't enclose it in quotes. If it's an alphabetic field, you enclose it in quotes. Now a delete may either succeed or fail, right? If it succeeds, it will delete that row and any of the other rows in other tables for which the cascade delete was set for. If, however, cascade delete is not set, all right, and deletion is restricted, this statement will fail if there are rows related to this particular faculty member. 
So for example, in the sample database we've been using before where there was a faculty ID, faculty ID in the student table and we were not cascading deletes, if we tried to delete this faculty person and there were students assigned to this faculty person, the delete wouldn't go. The delete would fail. You'd get an error. All right. If there were cascading deletes, then if we deleted from here, it would delete all of the related tables as well. Delete the rows for this particular faculty person and all the related tables as well. A delete will either completely succeed or completely fail. Now we'll talk more about this next week when we talk about uh, transactions. But SQL statements either completely succeed or they completely fail. Let me give you an example. If I said this, delete from customers, where state equals California. Let's say we were closing our California branch for whatever reason and we needed to delete our California customers. Okay. That will not just delete one customer, but that will delete every customer in California. Or let me put it this way. It'll try to delete every customer in California. Now, what would cause it to fail? Well, if one of those customers in California had a row in a related table and it was not set to cascade delete, you couldn't delete that customer. All right, let's say one of our California customers had an order, let's say, in the outstanding order table and it was not set to cascade delete. All right, it wouldn't be able to delete that customer. Because it's not able to delete that customer, it won't delete any customer. All right. So it either completely succeeds or completely fails. It's treated as a unit. It's not going to go and delete some of the customers and leave others behind, the ones that have the, the foreign key uh, issue. All right. Likewise, if I were to have a customer table that related to two other tables, if this one was set to cascade, and this one was set to restrict. If I tried to delete a customer and it had rows in each of these two tables, it wouldn't be able to delete that customer because of the restrict constraint here. It would not go and cascade delete that customer from this table. So either everything gets deleted that you're trying to delete or nothing gets deleted. All right, succeeds or fails. You're typically going to have a where clause because if not, it's going to try to delete every row from that table. And, and there's really rare cases only where you'd want to delete everything from a table. Questions about the delete? The update works like this. Let's say I moved, all right? Update faculty set address equals one, two, three, four Main Street, comma, city equals Elyria, comma, state equals Ohio, comma, zip equals 44035 where faculty ID equals 1234. Again, an update will only do one table. All right. Update the name of the table, then the word set, and then you have pairs of the name of the column equals the value. If the value is an alphanumeric, a text thing, it will be enclosed in quotes. If it's a numeric thing, it will not be enclosed in quotes. And then finally, we have a where clause on here, 
because otherwise it will try to update everyone. It will try to make everyone uh, move to that address, which, you know, I like my coworkers, but I don't want all of them living in my house. All right? So therefore, we would want a where clause on this. Now, the where clause doesn't have to be the primary key. For example, if we were going to, let's say one salesman quit, and we were going to transfer all his customers to another sales rep. Let's say our Ohio sales rep quit, and we were going to transfer all, our sales, all, all of his customers to another sales rep. We could say something like this. Update customer set sales rep ID equal some value where state equals Ohio. And what that would do is that would take all the customers that are in Ohio and assign them to that, that sales rep. So we could have a SQL statement like that that would go and just transfer everyone uh, to, to another sales rep. What would make a update statement fail? Well, if we supplied the wrong kind of data, if we had a, a field for salary, for example, and we tried to put a word in there, all right, that would give us an error. Because, you know, presumably salary would be a numeric field. If we violate any foreign key constraints, for example, in this update, if there was a foreign key between sales rep table and the customer table, and we use this update, if, we, if there was no sales rep 1, 2, 3, 4, we would get an error. Likewise, if there was a field that re was a required field, and we tried to put a null value or an empty value in it, we would get an error. Again, that's a good thing, right? Because, if you remember, one of the other benefits of relational databases is that you can set up all these constraints. You can set up the data type constraints. You can set up referential integrity. You can set up all these constraints, say a field is required, all right? And therefore, it doesn't matter how you try to get data in that table, all right? It won't work. It, it, you know, it won't work if the constraints are violated. So if you try to put, uh, update a, a, count, uh, uh, a row that doesn't have, uh, and you don't give a value for, for one of the fields that's required, or you put something in that violates one of the foreign key constraints. That only leaves us with the insert statement. And there's actually a couple forms of the insert statement. We will talk about the, the main form that you will use, and then we will talk about um, alternatives possibly next week. We might spend a, a couple minutes on Tuesday. So I lied. We'll get, we'll get a, our last blast at SQL next week, probably. Anyhow, the primary form of the insert statement is like this. Insert into faculty. And then you give a list of columns. And then you have the list of values. Again, same thing. If it's a if it's a alphabetic or alphanumeric field, it's enclosed in quotes. If it's a numeric field, it isn't. If there's an auto number involved, you don't need to use the auto number in the insert statement. That will automatically get set for you. What would make this fail? Well, again, if I tried to insert a row in a table and I violated a foreign key constraint. Or if I tried to insert a row in a table and 
let's say without using uh, an auto number key, I duplicated a primary key. Or I had a, had a, a required field that I didn't give a value to. All those things would cause this to fail. Yes? Writing it up just like that will actually enter it into the table properly. That will actually enter it into the table properly. Like the first name is the first one that's listed on the values. Right. In other words, yeah, it, right, exactly. It matches them up in order. Like that. Now again, why would you write a SQL statement like this? Well, again, remember you're going to incorporate this into a program. So you're not going to write a program to add Mike Zellers into the database, right? You're going to write a program that will have the shell of an insert statement or an update statement or a delete insert in the faculty. Then you'll have your columns. And the values will be blanks that will be filled in from the different pieces of your program. For example, you might have a text box that has a first name. You might have a text box for the last name. You might have a drop down field for the state or whatever. So again, I'm writing these like as hard coded uh, uh, statements. All right? And if you think about it, there's really no need to write that statement in a program to insert me in. Because once I'm in the database, I'm there. I'm never going to want to do that again. What is done, however, is the program doesn't insert a particular person in. The program is generic enough. It's almost like a parameterized query in Access, right? Where you can put in a value when you run it, and it will use that value in performing the query. Same thing with here. You can put in a value when you run it and you can insert that faculty person. Now again, notice all of these work just on one table and all of these will either completely succeed or completely fail. All right. Um, what causes them to fail again is typically um, either the data types are mismatched or it's violating one of the constraints. I guess, you know, for the most part, you could say what makes these fail is that you know, you're, you're violating one of the rules that you've defined in the database. All right. I'm going to look at the schedule for next week. I want to talk about a couple of more things that sort of relate to SQL. And I might spend a little bit of time doing uh, something like taking a access, uh, I'm sorry, not access, an Excel worksheet and incorporating it into a SQL database. Um, that's something that, that, that's one of those classic tasks that, that, that people get assigned. All right? And through clever use of SQL, we can pull in the spreadsheet and actually create our table using these different SQL statements. So it'd be good. It'll be good if we could spend a little bit of time doing that anyhow. Maybe, maybe a whole class or maybe half of a class. All right. We'll see you over in lab.